Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack, thank you so much for joining us today in your personal capacity. Just to get started, what messages did Democrats share with rural voters and farmers during the convention? Well, I think a, a message of inclusion. Uh, I think the Harris Wall, uh, the Harris, the uh, uh, Biden Harris administration has established a foundation of investments in rural communities to improve life across the board. The re rescue plan, the Inflation Reduction Act, the, bio, uh, the infrastructure law, uh, the commodity credit card, all of those investments have created a platform, a foundation for real progress. And we've seen this in a rural population now increasing for the first time in quite some time. We're seeing persistent poverty come down in rural communities. So something's working and the question is whether we want to continue it or whether we want to go back uh, to a circumstance and situation where we in fact had declining populations uh, under the Trump administration. We had persistent poverty increasing under the Trump administration. Uh, a plan that they're proposing to increase the cost of American families of $3,800 through the imposition of tariffs. Tax cuts that will be directed to the wealthy as opposed to the middle class. There's a real contrast here between the vision, between the investment, between the results of, of an administration that Vice President Harris has been involved with versus the administration that uh, President Trump led for four years. There's been a lot of focus at the convention on issues like abortion. How do you think issues like that will play in rural areas? Well, look, uh, reproductive uh, health services are incredibly important uh, to women across the, uh, America because they aren't just simply restricted to abortion. They, they include a broad range of health care services that are fundamental and important. Uh, I think the Democrats have conveyed a strong message to American women, which is we understand and appreciate you need to be in charge of your own body. You need to have access to health care services. You should not have to go through the gut-wrenching stories that we've heard uh, from the convention uh, this week, uh, which are, are truly heartbreaking. Uh, and unnecessary. And it's pretty clear from the Project 2025 document and the transition plan that they've put together that they're looking to restrain and restrict even further reproductive health uh, services. And so uh, I think there's, a, again, a clear contrast. How do you think Walls' background will allow him to connect with rural voters, particularly those in deep red, Trump-heavy districts during past elections? You know, a guy can uh, take down a pheasant with a shot who's wearing that plaid shirt coming out of the closet. Look, he is all about small town and rural America. He understands it. He came from it. And it's not a situation where he was, he, you know, he lived in a small town. Small town is part of who he is. It's part of his DNA. Uh, so I can guarantee you that with uh, Tim Walls as vice president of the United States, uh, rural folks will always be front and center. Uh, always be at top of mind, if you will, as policies are being formulated and implemented. Uh, Tim Walls is, an, was an, is an, a, an excellent governor. He was a wonderful member of the House Agriculture Committee. He understands the intricacies of, of agriculture and rural life. Uh, and as a result, he's going to be a powerful force. Uh, and I'm excited about this because I think Democrats actually can and should be messaging uh, not only a message of gratitude uh, to people who live, work, and raise their families in rural places, uh, but a message that, yes, we, we see you, we are investing uh, in you because we know how important you are. We know that you're feeding us. We know that you are providing the power that we use in this economy. We know that you're hardworking. We know that you're sending your uh, sons and daughters to the military in disproportionate numbers. Tim Walls knows all about that. In fact, he has been one of those young people wearing the uniform for 24 years. So. Uh, excited about this opportunity. I think it was a tremendous pick uh, and uh, really, really excited about it. Harris has yet to detail her proposals in a number of areas, including the climate space. How would a Harris administration differ from a Biden administration in terms of climate policy? Well, I think it, uh, a difference, uh, I don't know if it's a difference, but I think it's an, it's an acceleration, if you will, of the understanding that climate creates an opportunity an opportunity to transition an economy to create better paying jobs, to bring manufacturing back to our shores. By having America provide leadership in uh, a net zero future, uh, being able to show the world how it's done, how you create clean energy, how you create clean transportation systems, how you create a, a cleaner uh, construction uh, industry, how you do this in, in agriculture, how you do it across the entire set of industries that make up an economy. 
Uh, because of the foundation that's been laid in the Bias-Harris administration, a Harris-Walls administration can accelerate the job opportunities, can accelerate uh, the income uh, and the wealth creation that this is going to bring. And the great thing about this is a lot of it's going to have to be done in rural places because if you're going to sequester carbon, there are only two places you can do that uh, on land, and that's in a forest and on a farm. Uh, you can do it in the oceans. And so here, rural America... Where are the forests? Where are the farms? They're predominantly in rural places. So it's an exciting opportunity that I think you'll see uh, more investment in and, and, and more opportunity created from. Farm groups have told us that they're optimistic about what a Harris-Walls administration could do for biofuel policy. How do you think a Harris administration could balance both biofuel policy with the electric vehicle incentives the Biden administration has worked on? So I'm going to talk about this in a general standpoint because I don't want to get too uh, in the weeds in terms of what USDA does because that wouldn't be proper in this circumstance. But from a transportation perspective, the Department of Energy, the Department of Transportation, the EPA, USDA, and, and, and other agencies have a, a vested interest in making sure uh, that we not only continue uh, what we have with the renewable fuel standard and continue to provide that fuel that's necessary for cars and trucks, because we're going to continue to have cars and trucks that need that fuel for a long time. We're still making those cars and trucks. We're still keeping our cars and trucks for a long period of time. So for probably the next 15 or 20 years, there's no, there's no doubt we're going to need that fuel. But the exciting opportunity is that we're also going to need that same kind of fuel for our jet planes and for our ships. Now, all of a sudden, you're not talking about a 15 or 20 billion gallon industry. You're talking about a 35 or 50, a 50 billion gallon industry a year. Holy cow. You're talking about a million jobs, most of which will be in rural places. You're talking about tremendous opportunities uh, on, on this and providing international leadership where the United States is essentially saying we're going to lead in sustainable aviation fuel uh, development and we're going to lead in, in the development of a variety of feedstocks that can be used to create that fuel. Harris has suggested a federal ban on price gouging in the food industry, but many economists say such a ban could backfire on consumers and even create food shortages. How is this going to work? Well, I tell you, there have been circumstances and situations during, during COVID where people took or, or, or uh, during the course of uh, um, HPAI that took uh, advantage of the circumstance and situation and they upped the price just a smidge uh, that they didn't have to. And that's the kind of practice that we have to be wary of and we have to be focused on. There's been a consolidation, and that consolidation has created uh, a, a, the ability of some uh, to essentially dictate prices that might be higher than they would be if there was more competition. Uh, so it's important and necessary, I think, for, uh, for the federal government to be on the side of consumers. And I think that's essentially what uh, Vice President Harris is saying. Okay, you got a choice. You can be on the side of the industry or you can be on the side of the consumer. We're going to be on the side of the consumer. We're going to make sure that it's a level playing field, it's a balanced playing field, it's a fair playing field. Uh, that may take uh, more competition. It may take keeping an eye on folks. It may take a little bit of regulation in terms of people who are, who are taking advantage of the circumstance. But whatever it is, it's a combination of things that levels the playing field so that when people go into the shop, go into the, the store, go into whatever, they know they're going to get a fair deal. And if they don't, somebody's going to keep an eye on it and somebody's going to force that fair deal to be, uh, to be developed. To finish, tell us about your perspective working with Kamala Harris and Tim Walls. What makes you most excited about these two individuals and the future of the Democratic Party? Well, it's the combination. Uh, Vice President Harris comes from California, which, as you know, is a fairly significant agricultural state. So, so obviously that's front of mind for her. Tim Walls, because of his service in Congress and, and, and as governor of a, of a state that is heavily dependent on, on, on agriculture, obviously in rural places, uh, obviously will be a great champion. So it's the combination of the, and the partnership and the, the chemistry between these folks. There's, there's obvious chemistry. There's obvious connection between these folks, which I, I think is really, really important. Uh, I know that uh, Vice President Harris is a collaborator. She's somebody that wants guidance from a variety of different uh, uh, points of view uh, before she makes decisions. So I think that's a smart way to decide. And the fact that Tim Walls is in the room and maybe the last person in the room as that decision is being made 
guarantees that rural interests will always be uh, in that room, always be part of the discussion. And I think that's just, just extraordinarily exciting, especially coming from a Democratic administration. A Democratic administration that she was part of that has made an historic investment in rural places. So this is not Johnny come lately or Kamala come lately. This is uh, a true commitment as reflected in where the money from the infrastructure law, the Inflation Reduction Act, the, the rescue plan, where all that money went. It didn't go to urban centers. It didn't go to blue states. It went all over the country, and a, a significant amount of it went into red states, and a significant amount of that money went into rural communities. Not necessarily people that supported the Biden-Harris ticket. But that's her mentality. I'm president of all the people, not just the people who voted for me. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.